The next up is, uh, it's, a, it's a privilege and an honor for me to introduce uh, Dr. David Wallman from the University of Rochester, uh, Chairman of the Department of Radiology. Uh, he trained me and inspired me to do interventional radiology, taught me how to do tips, and uh, it's just, uh, I, can't, I can't say enough about what this man has done for me. And it, it's been David Wallman. Thank you very much. Um, it's an honor to be here uh, for a couple of reasons, uh, because I'm very proud both of Chris and Wael, who I helped uh, train, um, and they're both your next two speakers, so that's a thrill for me to see that. Um, the first speaker talked about a lot of the stuff I'm going to talk about, and Chris told me I couldn't talk about hemodynamics, so I'm not sure there's a whole lot I can really talk about. Um, but what I want to say is I love doing TIPS. I think TIPS is a great procedure, and I think it is a very underutilized procedure. Um, there are a couple of caveats. I think that if it takes you longer than 45 minutes to an hour to do a TIPS, you shouldn't be doing a TIPS. And that's much different than a lot of centers. And, and we have a rule that if you're not in the portal vein within 45 minutes, you need to call another attending to help you do this tips. Um, I think that's a very good um, way to start. So I'm going to talk a little bit about tips. I have nothing to disclose. I am on a couple of medical advisory boards. I'm going to talk about the clinical indications, the contraindications, um, the benefits, and something about the techniques and show a little bit about the results. Uh, I am going to try to go very fast and stay on time, uh, so bear with me. Uh, portal hypertension, we talked about, we all know about it. Some of the things that weren't stressed is that uh, 70 to 80 percent of everything, all the blood that goes to the liver actually comes from the portal vein. That is an awful lot of blood flow going from the portal vein. The absolute definition of portal hypertension um, is uh, <clears throat> greater than 11 millimeters of mercury or a gradient of greater than six. That's all I will say about hemodynamics because Chris told me not to talk about it. So what are the indications for doing TIPS? Why are we doing TIPS? Most of the indications really have to do with patients who come in either uh, with refractory ascites, uh, which, which uh, is an elective procedure, or a hydro hydrothorax, again, was an elective procedure, or less commonly is having an acute variceal bleed. Now, we used to do tips all the time during the middle of the night. We no longer do that. Um, really, the patients get stabilized, and everything is done in a much more controlled environment, usually in the morning, and uh, it's a much less chaotic procedure than in the beginning. I will tell you one story about the first tips ever done at the University of Rochester. It was done with Fred Keller, who was at the uh, Daughter Institute. He flew to Rochester, and he was mentoring Oscar Guterres, and it took him six and a half hours and 1.9 liters of contrast. So what are the contraindications to doing TIPS? Right-sided heart failure, polycystic liver disease, severe hepatic failure, um, a bad INR, uh, intrahepatic or systemic infection, uh, encephalopathy is probably the largest one, a hypervascular tumor, or portal vein thrombosis. I will show you a case in a little bit about portal vein thrombosis, because sometimes doing a TIPS is actually the right thing to do for portal vein thrombosis. What is the sequelae of doing a TIPS? Well, sometimes you can put a patient into acute liver failure, right? Now, I will tell you that our transplant surgeons like us doing TIPS. I think one of the reasons they like us doing TIPS is because they can move some of their patients up the list. Some people who, who uh, may be sort of borderline and we do a TIPS and all of a sudden they go into acute hepatic failure that moves them up in the list. The other thing I will say about transplant and TIPS are, are transplant surgeons also believe that it decreases their, their blood loss during a transplant procedure. So we actually do a fair amount of tips on patients who are going to transplant in the next several weeks. History of tips. All right, so uh, uh, Joseph Roche really had the idea of tips. So we knew that the portal vein had 
too much pressure in it. And he was the one who said, well, we need to create a shunt in between some other vein and the portal vein. And he had the idea of doing a tips. Now, he never actually, he was not one of the first people who did a TIPS. The first percutaneous TIPS was done at the University of Rochester by uh, two people, one Francis Bergner and the other one was Oscar Guterres. Colapinto in the 1980s, he did the first reported uh, TIPS in a patient and then went on. We then had the first use of stents for a TIPS and then we had wall stents for the TIPS and in 1993, LeBerge actually uh, published the first series of tips within the United States. Now what you are looking at here is actually the first tips um, ever done percutaneously in an animal. And where the H is the hepatic vein and where the L is is sort of the liver and the portal vein. And you can see there's sort of this straw that's coming from the neck. Um, there were no, no stents, there were no balloons, and what, or there were, no, there were no stents. And so what they did was they just ballooned the track between the hepatic vein and the portal vein and they could only keep this open for 24 hours. Um, so they really, this, you know, this was a great experimental model, but there was no real way to keep these uh, open. Artie talked about the scoring of liver disease. Now this is important for us to know, not because we need to know the exact thing of the scoring and what it really means. We need to know what does it mean for our patients who are having TIPS. TIPS does not fix liver disease. In fact, I just told you TIPS makes liver disease worse. So the reason we need to know that is because if you take a child's class C patient and you do a TIPS on him, you probably are not going to do him much benefit. He is going to have a rocky road no matter what you do. And so you need to understand that going into it. Child's class A and child's class B are really the, the patient population that we should be focusing on. Uh, same thing for MELD score. These are the two scoring systems that you sort of should have in the back of your mind. Now MELD score is interesting. There are four levels that you should know about. Level uh, 10 and then 11 to 18, 19 to 24, and greater than 25. So in the United States, the MELD score of most transplants is 20. Just keep that in your mind. And as you can see, this is the, the survival of patients with MELD scores. And as the top line shows, um, the, the lower the MELD score, the longer their survival. And that is just what you would expect not rocket science. So what is a TIPS? We're connecting the hepatic vein to the portal vein. And I have a little uh, video here which shows we get jugular access, we put a needle down, it's usually a colapinto needle or a Roshishita needle, we then create a pathway and then we put in a stent. When we first started doing these, there were bare metal stents, then we went to covered stents. We'll talk a little bit about the difference between the two and why we switched from a bare metal stent to a covered stent in a, middle, in a minute. Um, and then you measure pressures before you do it and after after you do it, um, and then you're done. So these are our, our weapons of choice. So what you're looking at is a colapinto needle, which is a 16 gauge needle. There is another tips set uh, for the most part that, that's also used, and that is a more or less a colapinto guide with a smaller five French Roshishita needle inside of it that then you puncture with. Uh, when we first started in Rochester, we started with the smaller needle, when I trained and did my fellowship at Brown, they used the, the colapinto needle, and um, I've used the colapinto needle ever since. I like the big blood gush, I like to know that I'm in the portal vein, um, and I also, it's much faster by using the, I find it much faster by using the larger needle. I have not had many complications by using the larger needle compared to the smaller needle. This is a Viator stent, most of it is covered, there is a part that's uncovered. The uncovered part sits in the portal vein, so you don't jail the portal vein. The covered part stays within the liver. So what do you need to know before you do a TIPS? You need to know is the portal vein patent. So how do you do this? You can either do this with ultrasound or with CT. They both work the same. Um, they're both excellent tools. 
you don't really need to know any more about the portal vein than it is, is open. Now the problem with the portal vein is that it is somewhat variable. So if you think that you're in the right portal vein, you want to aim a little bit anterior and medial when you make your puncture into the portal vein. However, if you're in the middle, it may be posterior or it may be anterior, you don't really know. Now the classic teaching is that you want to try to do a TIPS from the right hepatic vein. I will tell you my own preference. I don't care whether I'm in the right vein or the middle vein. I want the biggest vein and I want the easiest vein and I want the first vein I can get into. After you do that, you do a wedged uh, venogram. I will tell you, again, my own preference, and I'm giving you some bias here, and I was just talking to YL before this, the reason for doing the wedged venogram is only for the residents and fellows' sake. It's only to show the residents and fellows that the, the portal vein is actually patent and it's there. I personally don't find this very useful. If I know the portal vein is patent, I more or less know where it exists and I don't really, I don't see the point of doing this. So if I am doing a TIPS by myself, I forgo this step. Portal access we talked about. Pre-TIPS, post-TIPS looks very nice. You'll notice all the varices are gone. These are just a couple of recent cases from the University of Rochester. You'll notice on the top left, this is a, case, a patient with Bud Chiari. On the top left, there are no real hepatic veins. A TIPS is, is uh, created, and this uh, patient then went on and did very well. This is a second case with a completely occluded portal vein. We actually put a wire in from the side percutaneously through the portal vein, and then we punctured on that wire. We then stented, we did the tips, we stented the tips, we put a catheter in and infused uh, um, um, TPA overnight, didn't really help. We then did what we really shouldn't do, we stented all the way down to the SMV. Now before we did this, we had a long discussion with our transplant surgeons, is this okay? Um, they, were, they said, well, it's, it's your only option, and so they, we did this, and uh, this patient actually has done uh, remarkably well. I don't know if he actually will make it uh, to transplant. So what are the complications? So the complications are, can be sort of broken up into three different levels. You can have procedural related complications, TIPS related complications, and late type of complications. So the procedural complications, one of the biggest procedural complications is if you are too vigorous with that hepatic wedge injection and you put a hole out the side of the liver. Um, that has, there have been some reported cases where patients actually can bleed out and die. So that is one of the reasons I sort of try to shy away from that. Um, the other complications you can have are just from the number of punctures you make, um, and you can, you can uh, harm the hepatic vein, you can harm the portal vein, or you can uh, do a nice cholangiogram, I mean, you can drain the gallbladder. There are all these intraprocedural things, but for the most part, the human body is amazing. I mean, it is, it is remarkable what, how much we can do to the human body and it just keeps bouncing back. There are TIPS-related complications and portal systemic encephalopathy is, is the biggest problem we have. And the more aggressive we've been getting with creating larger shunts, the more this has become a problem. Um, and uh, so we actually now start our shunts out at eight millimeters and, uh, and we will only bring them up to 10 millimeters uh, at a later date if the patient doesn't have encephalopathy issues. There are late complications uh, with uh, hemolytic anemia, um, tip stenosis, um, you can have infections. I have never seen it, but it is reported in the literature. Varices, do you embolize them or don't you embolize them? That's always the question, you're there. Should we embolize them? Well, our philosophy is you embolize the varices if the patient is actively bleeding. If he's not bleeding, we don't embolize. The other caveat I will say is that when we do our final portogram, if we don't see the varices, for the most part, we will not embolize them. So what are the results? <clears throat> 
Um, we have about a greater, everybody should have a greater than 90% success of doing TIPS. The one year survival rate uh, is 100%, 86%, and 73% for child's class A, B, and C. That's what you would expect. It's actually not much different than what you would expect for the life expectancy of a child's class A, B, or C patient without a TIPS, just from their liver disease. What's the response rate to, to ascites and to um, their uh, hydrothorax? It's quite good, and it ranges between 60 and 90 percent. So um, those results are, are quite good. Um, we do have, we have, again, we have seen a fairly high rate of encephalopathy, and so we have become less vigorous in, in, how, in how, uh, how big we're going to make that shunt. So in the early 2000s, when we started doing TIPS, we, we used bare stents. Now then there was this, this unproven theory of why we got re-instent stenosis. And that theory is that the bile got into the, the stent and created a reaction with the blood flow and you get neointimal hyperplasia. Well, I never understood how you could get neointimal hyperplasia in something that isn't really a blood vessel, right? A bare stent within a liver, it's not really a blood vessel. So I don't know what it is, but you get instant stenosis. And it was a real problem. These patients come back, we're not very good at it. And so what we found is that, that you, first of all, you have to have very high surveillance. But if you start using a covered stent, you have a much, much lower percentage of instant stenosis. Stenosis. And I think TIPS got a very bad rap because when we started doing TIPS and we started using bear stents, then the patients started coming back every six months, every 12 months, and had to have a re-intervention. We never actually then got on the bandwagon to say, you know, this is a, actually a much better study if we use a covered stent compared to using a um, bare metal stent. Very few stenosis with uh, with covered stents. Um, these, these are just some uh, revision rates, um, and you can see the revision rates for the Viator stents are much, much lower than compared to a bare wall stent. Um, liver failure, we sort of uh, already talked about, um, and our philosophy of our transplant surgeons. Um, I do want to say that one, one of the aspects of, of all liver disease in Rochester is that it is not just interventional radiology, it is not just the hepatologist, it's actually a multidisciplinary group between the transplant surgeons, the interventional radiologists, the hepatologists, and even the oncologists, because a lot of these cirrhotic patients also have HCC that we have to worry about, and so um, we actually uh, have a conference once a week concerning all of these patients. The other thing that has happened, and, and again, all medicine is regional, right? It's not, uh, it, it, what, what happens in Rochester is that we are the only center between Syracuse in Buffalo, in fact, Syracuse, they don't do any tips. In Buffalo, they don't, don't do any tips. So all of those patients get referred to Rochester. And so every, all of those patients then get discussed in that, in that uh, committee to decide what is the best treatment for those patients. So I would impress upon everybody that when you look at tips and when you think about uh, portal hypertension, it is not just a disease that a, um, that, that a interventional radiologist takes care of. It's not just a disease that a hepatologist takes care of or a GI doc. It really should be viewed as a multidisciplinary approach. So thank you for your attention. Whirlwind tour. Um, and uh, thanks again. <laughs>